evening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that presentation just now, giving us sort of a capsule of the department's activities, uh, as well as some of the, the um, outreach that we've been doing in the department, and the long history as well of this event that has brought us all here this evening, the Elsa Gobaya Memorial Lecture. Uh, Sir Roy Auger, uh, distinguished professors in MIT, I'm looking against a very bright light in both my eyes, so forgive me if I don't pick up on folks immediately, but Professor Carl Campbell, Professor Patrick Bryan, Professor Rupert Lewis, Professor Maureen Warner Lewis, uh, colleagues from the department, students, friends, family, brothers, sisters, all welcome. And thank you for joining us once again. For this, our premier annual event in the department, the El Segovia Memorial Lecture. Uh, and this, this lecture is uh, very special for many reasons. As always, a primary reason why it's special is the uh, guest lecturer that we have. And we're very pleased to have with us this evening um, Professor Brenda Gale Plummer from the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and uh, also a special greetings to Professor Donald Ferguson, who is also here as well uh, for this event. The reason why we have this lecture uh, every year, and this is the 34th year that we've been doing it consecutively, is to honor one of the pioneers in the department, someone who uh, tirelessly worked to build the department, not just inside, internally, in terms of its administrative structure and the business that we do, which is teaching on this campus, but also to spread that work far and wide across this island and across the region. And that is, of course, Professor Elsa Vesta Govaya. Professor Govaya's reputation is, uh, is, is legendary, uh, and a lot of it is attributed not just to her scholarship, as strong and as vibrant and still inspirational and influential as it is, but also to the commitment that she had to Caribbean history teaching as part of the, um, the, the, the mandate that we have in this region, those of us who have the privilege and benefit of education, to pass that on to others and to other generations, in the high schools and in all our interactions. And that's why the department has for so long seen fit to honor her memory uh, with this event. To orient us to uh, Professor Gobayo and her contributions, we put together a video which we premiered at last year's event, and we're going to show you now uh, for the benefit of all of us here in the audience, but especially for the students. I know there are many students here, and I, I am very pleased to see students turning on for this event this evening. It's really meaningful when we have student turn on. And you may know the name Elsa Gobayo, but you may not fully appreciate uh, the, the weight of Elsa Gobayo's contribution. So without any further ado, I'm going to now uh, introduce to you this film called Reflections on Elsa Gobayo. When I was at college as an undergraduate student, that is at University College London, I did English history, not West Indian history, and it was not until I became a postgraduate student working for my doctorate that I began to do West Indian history. The name Elsa Gavaya had become a legend before she arrived in England in 1945. Most Guyanese mentioned her name with reverence and indeed awe, as she was the first woman to have broken the tradition by winning the one territorial scholarship in Guyana. That scholarship took her to University College London, and there, in her final year, she topped the class, won the Pollard Prize for English History, the prestigious prize that was awarded to the best history scholar at University College London. It was a feat which made the senior professor at UCL write to the director of colonial scholars and describe her as remarkable. An unmistakable feature of Elsa Gavaya's career is that she was the first person to teach a flagship course in West Indian history at this university. This was what she was recruited to do. Elsa Gavaya and this very special second year course in West Indian history 
became inseparable for three decades. I do the teaching in West Indian history, which is my special interest, and I also do the teaching in the history of Latin America. In addition to this, uh, I do research in West Indian history, which is the subject that most particularly concerns me. Elsa Govaya is foundational to this faculty. So foundational is she that even before she was so appointed, her appointment was called for, not by name, but by post, in the Urban Commission which set up this university. The Urban Commission's report includes a specific reference to the need for a lecturer in Caribbean history when the university began to ensure the issue of Caribbean identity. And Elsa Govaya was the first such appointee. Now, you plan to go to England soon, I gather. Um, what exactly are you going to undertake this time? At this time, I'm hoping to do some work in the Public Record Office, where, as I say, it's possible to find a great deal of material in a relatively short time. And there, the main object of my search is going to be to find the British West Indian slave laws. I'm particularly interested in British West Indian history during the 18th century, which is, of course, the great period of slavery, and I'm working on the slave laws, and this is one of the things that I should be doing in London during this summer. You can go to France or America, India, Asia, or Australia, but you must come back to London City. I wrote the historiography of the British West Indies as part of a series of historiographies dealing with the Americas. The object of this book was to discuss the work of historians of the British West Indies and to try to evaluate the work that they'd written. The author, for all her scholarly detachment, writes with an earnestness born of wide knowledge and deep sympathy, which relatively few West Indian historians have previously achieved. She writes in a clear, lucid, unaffected style, which is a pleasure to read. In general, Miss Gavire's criticisms are well-informed, penetrating and scrupulously fair. With her own wide knowledge of the West Indian past, she is able not only to describe what the author said, but also to explain why they said it. Well, my impressions of federal development, I should say, are those of a, an individual who is very much in favor of a closer union of the West Indies, so that to some extent, perhaps I may be regarded as biased. But I regard myself as a West Indian and that I should like to see the Federation succeed. Elsa Kapai was able to use West Indian history as a social science tool to explain to campus audiences the historical foundations of our modern West Indian dilemmas. She put history at the center of the enterprise of making us West Indians. For 30 years with her other colleagues, they ensured that the region came to understand for the first time, really, that they had a history. They were more than an appendage of the British Empire, but had something with its own internal dynamic. And in that regard, their graduates, people they taught, the teachers who left here in the 50s and 60s, Return throughout the Caribbean, not consciously doing it, but even evangelizing and building Caribbean identity. And crucial to that would have been the work of Elsa Govaya. We honor her first as a scholar, 
we honor her also as an inspiring teacher and we remember her as our mentor and exemplar. We honor her because she pioneered and established West Indian history as an academic discipline. And finally, we remember her for the person that she was. For Elsa Gavaya. And here we are remembering the dark woman who searched out meaning in the dust and left us the enigma of her going. I find contact with young students whose minds are open to new ideas, a very stimulating experience indeed, and even though it is also exhausting, I don't think I should like to do without it. A very special thanks to all the folks who made that, that video possible. Um, Dr. Julian Cressa, who uh, worked very hard on putting it together. Mr. Sean Markian of the UE Archives um, Media Lab. Uh, the folks at the University of the West Indies Main Library. Uh, Dr. Paul, Paul at Carr Campus Library. Mrs. Francis Salmon of UE Special Collections. All pitched in um, to help put that together, that tribute to us to provide together. Which I should add, we have uh, a link to it on our website. So here's a plug for our social media um, uh, footprint. If you go on the department website or Facebook page, you can um, find a link to that video where you can um, view it again and more importantly, hopefully share it with people that, that you think uh, would appreciate it. Sometime in the early 1970s, Elsa Gobayo revised her flagship course in the department course, of course, being the history of the Caribbean. In the new lecture structure, she added a final lecture topic to the course outline. And this is the topic, Black Power, its historical justification. The addition of this focus on Black Power was no doubt a result of the events that had been stirred on this campus in 1968, in Trinidad in 1970, and the wider implications of a call for the recognition of black people's rights that had engulfed black activism in the United States in the 1960s and through into the 1970s. It is perhaps not coincidental that the lecture that Gavaya scheduled on black power was to be preceded by a lecture on US imperialism in the Caribbean. In a sense, Elsa Gavaya was drawing attention to the import and heavy influence of these wide occurrence, often located in North American histories for the Caribbean they were not divorced in her mind. When, a, when in a public lecture in the 1950s, a listener asked her what slavery was like for the enslaved, she replied all one had to do was imagine life for people in the US South. These connections, which were obvious in Govaya's mind and insistent in her writings, are also the elements that have marked the remarkable body of scholarship that has been written by Professor Brenda Gale Plummer. Professor of History in the Department of History and in the Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In a sterling career, she has created an esteemed vitae that is as varied as it is rigorous, grounded in the perspective of seeing the Caribbean as creator and reflective of larger intellectual currents emanating often from the global north. Professor Plummer started her academic journey with a BA from Antioch College in Ohio. She also spent time in Nigeria and Tanzania as a student. She completed her MA at Columbia before moving on to PhD studies at Cornell University. At Cornell, she studied with Walter Lefebvre, a giant in the history, uh, uh, in revisionist history of US foreign policy. The merger of her interests in US imperialism and black history guided her to the study of US foreign policy in Haiti during the early 20th century. Professor Plummer was one of the first historians writing in English to bring depth, close analysis, and the use of multi-archival sources to the study of Asian history. And importantly, 
I should add here, the use of Haitian sources. Uh, quite often, Haitian sources were, were not uh, seriously in, involved or in, 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 um, integrated in the study of Haiti that uh, people outside of the country uh, did. She was a pioneer in the revisionism of the US occupation of Haiti, finding in it much deeper implications than diplomacy. The product of this painstaking research was an impressive dissertation titled Black and White in the Caribbean, Haitian-American Relations, 1902 to 1934. And if I'm correct, it amounts to over a thousand pages or close to it. <laughs> um, I'm proud to say, and the campus librarian is here, I'm proud to say that we have a copy of her dissertation in the West Indies collection. Uh, in two parts, bound in two parts. And like a very good old film, it has space and intermission in between. This research led to her first book, Haiti and the Great Powers, 1902 to 1950, a hard copy of which I picked up as an undergraduate in the UE bookshop. A special thanks to Prof. Carl Campbell, who was teaching a course on Haiti then, who I'm sure was behind uh, the, the ordering of that book. It is a classic text, which is still assigned to students of Haiti today. That book was supplemented by another book, Haiti and the United States, and several path-breaking articles on Haiti that explored, among other topics, Arab migration to Haiti, the response of African Americans to the US occupation of Haiti in the 1920s, the golden age of Haitian tourism in the 1950s, and more recently, a very important article on the Garvey movement in Haiti. Professor Plummer has for more than 20 years now widened her earlier scholarship to consider more globally the relationship between African Americans and US foreign policy in the 20th century. At the heart of this work is her meticulous exposure of the various ways African Americans engage with US diplomacy in matters concerning imperialism, human rights, black solidarity, anti-colonialism, and the tensions of radical ideologies and nationalism in Africa and the Caribbean. Three major books have come out of this project. The first is Rising Wind, Black Americans and US Foreign Affairs, 1935 to 1960, which was published by UNC Press in 1996. And Rising Wind, Wind won the prestigious Wellesley Logan Prize in African Diaspora History of the American Historical Association and the Myra F. Bernath Prize from the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, Schaefer. She also edited the collection Window on Freedom, Race, Civil Rights, and Foreign Affairs, 1945 to 1988, also with UNC Press. More recently, in 2013, she published a powerful study in search of power, African Americans in the era of decolonization, 1956 to 1974, with Cambridge University Press. Carol Anderson, chair of Emory uh, University's African American Studies, referred to this book as, quote, a masterpiece. Plummer has seamlessly woven together a thought-provoking tapestry from often disparate threads in African American African, Caribbean, international, and American history. In, de in doing so, she deepens the complexity of these struggles. This book is simply the result of a historian at the top of her craft, end quote. We're honored to have that historian with us here this evening at Mono. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, please help me welcome to deliver the 34th annual Elsa Gavaya Lecture, Professor Brenda Gale Plummer. Thank you, Professor Smith. Good evening, everyone. I'm, good evening. I'm deeply honored to have been chosen to deliver this lecture. Uh, I'd like to thank the Department of History and Archaeology and uh, Professor Smith for this opportunity, as well as Mrs. Camelia Clark Brown for providing the logistics that made my visit possible. I'm honored and pleased to be here. I titled this lecture, Pine and Palm. And uh, perhaps uh, what might immediately come to mind when thinking of that phrase uh, is a kind of a reverse allusion to Rudyard Kipling's uh, recessional about the coming demise of the British Empire. Uh, but that wasn't what I had in mind. Uh, I had another reference in mind, uh, and that was uh, Pine and Palm. A night, an 1861 newspaper 
uh, that was founded by one Reverend James Theodore Holly. Uh, Holly was an Anglican minister. Uh, he was a missionary. Uh, he was a proponent of uh, people of color leaving uh, Canada and the United States and migrating to Haiti. Uh, so uh, Pine and Palm then uh, was uh, uh, the response to uh, growing tensions in Canada uh, and the run up to the US Civil War uh, where free people of color were put in the most hazardous uh, condition um, and prompted many of them to seek to leave the United States uh, and to resettle in the Black Republic. Immigrationists, as they were called, made careful studies of the uh, economy and geography of 19th century Haiti and plotted the resettlement project in, in detail. Uh, those choosing to leave uh, Canada uh, and the United States um, not only were slipping the yoke of oppression, uh, they were also disestablishing Canada and the United States as centers of their allegiance and as the limits to their fortunes. Uh, interestingly, Haiti also uh, had itself uh, destabilized some of Western truisms uh, by making noir, black, a political category, uh, and by making uh, citizenship in Haiti uh, available to all Aboriginal and African descended people in the Western Hemisphere. So uh, we're talking not only about escape, we're also talking about reimagining reconstructing, reforming. Um, my purpose is to ponder several questions about all of this, and you know, particularly about studying uh, black movements past and present. I'd like to consider uh, what we can learn if we think of history in continental terms. Um, for uh, African Americans and uh, citizens of Caribbean nations, the United States and Canada have been the economically hegemonic powers. So among the questions we might pose, does the relationship between these powers have significance for African descended people on the continent? Are there shared technologies of governmentality? Uh, are there uh, challenges uh, to uh, this uh, uh, technology in the form of oppositional strategies uh, by people of color. And also, how can scholars evaluate the various triangulations that occur as nations of the North American mainland and the islands navigate historically embedded uh, relationships? Yet another question comes to mind. How can we envision a map that displaces the nation state as the primary beneficiary of citizens' allegiance and as the raison d'etre of conventional map making? During the worldwide depression of the 1930s, for example, um, many people in the Caribbean rebelled against bare subsistence and political repression. Uh, revolts occurred in St. Kitts, Guyana, St. Lucia, Trinidad, St. Vincent, Jamaica. The colonial office, recognizing the scope and gravity of the emergency, blasted the planter class for its archaic attitudes and practices. It was too late, however, to retrieve the lost luster of British imperialism as migration and broader exposure to the world after 1914 changed popular consciousness and remapped black loyalties. In Jamaica, some of those disillusioned at the time with the irresponsibility of the crown transferred their hopes 
to another empire. That of the Emperor Haile Selassie in embattled Ethiopia. Now, the principle of royalism remained intact, as it does, by the way, in the film Black Panther, which apparently is playing here as well as globally. No one is criticizing monarchy. Uh, the, the principle of royalism had uh, remained intact, but the chart had been replotted. Right? The treasured capital, no longer London, was now Addis Ababa. A reordering of geographic hierarchy had occurred. To be clear, power relations had not changed. Not everyone was enamored of the Lion of Judah. And furthermore, Ethiopia was no more a match for British muscle than it was for Mussolini's brutality. What had changed, however, was that a consciousness-altering intervention had been introduced. Something similar happened in the United States during the same period, in the 30s, 1930s, where Muslims of African descent posed challenges to American nationalism by stepping away from black people's presumptive Judeo-Christian affiliations, and in the process reconfigured a globe that now placed Mecca rather than Bethlehem at the center of both faith and political legitimacy. Now, what these are are examples of moral geography. Moral geography poses challenges to the power of the nation state system as well as to religion and culture. The geopolitical map of states remains the primary model of space, writes Michael J. Shapiro, who noticed this phenomenon and coined the term. The map of states betrays little of the alternative worlds destroyed and suppressed within modern cartography. And what were these worlds? Well, they would include the knowledge, for example, possessed by pre-colonial peoples who are no longer extant, lost language communities, knowledge of flora and fauna on terrains now altered beyond recognition, and more. Moral geography is to be distinguished from what Martin W. Lewis and Karen Wiggin in The Myth of Continents term metageography. Metageography, they say, embraces, quote, the set of spatial structures through which people order their knowledge of the world, the often unconscious frameworks that organize studies of history, sociology, anthropology, economics, and even natural history. Uh, moral geography, in contrast, uh, imputes conscious value, uh, affect, and often ideological purpose to those habits and traditions of classification. Okay, so we, we find then that the moral geography of continental unrest merges in the context of synchronous revolts in the United States, Canada, and the Caribbean. Um, in the 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, I'll be talking about those places. I'll be jumping around a little bit from one um, geographic area to the other, but our trajectory is going to be forward in time uh, from about 1968 to 74. There are possibilities inherent in looking at a North American rather than a nationally specific Black freedom struggle. This is where Foucault's insurrection of subjugated knowledges can lead to new insights about the African diaspora. Civil rights and black power movements provoke debate and practice that activists could interpret to alter conditions in their own countries. And while US discourses are widely adopted globally, their authority is displaced when they are charted onto a narrative of continuous exchange within the Americas, textured by the histories of slavery, migration, commerce, and revolution. The black Canadian experience offers an example of this. By the late 1960s, the black population there had grown and become much more vocal in its critique of racism and discrimination. 
In addition to uh, African and Caribbean inhabitants whose uh, Canadian residence uh, was in large part a function of uh, Commonwealth ties, Canada had another black population, a community in Nova Scotia that dated from the period of the American Revolution when the British, re the British Army repatriated, or expatriated really, uh, uh, black loyalist veterans from the uh, Patriot uh, areas. Canada, however, proved a somewhat indifferent asylum for uh, these uh, people. Uh, generations of uh, Nova Scotians had uh, lived and died in poverty and had experienced uh, uh, severe discrimination. Um, another source of the uh, uh, Canadian uh, black population were fugitive slaves um, uh, who uh, famously uh, followed the North Star, fled to Canada over the uh, course of the antebellum period, um, settling in um, Ontario, uh, called at the time Canada West. African Americans uh, entered the Canadian consciousness in yet another way that would uh, uh, prove uh, fateful in terms of understanding this linked continental uh, upsurge. And that is um, in uh, the 1960s. For example, uh, residents of Windsor, Ontario, uh, in late July of 1967, uh, could see the red fires of insurgent Detroit burning in the night sky, right next door. So this map uh, suggests um, what's taking place in the hemisphere, at least in the northern part. Uh, we have uh, a uh, nationalist movement um, in Quebec of uh, people who are attempting to reclaim linguistic and cultural rights. Uh, we have uh, Aboriginal protest movements in both uh, Canada and uh, in the United States. Uh, we have uh, increasingly outspoken uh, Caribbean residents um, uh, in Canada. In the United States, uh, there is a black power movement um, that uh, is affecting uh, every state in the Union. And we have black power movements in the Caribbean. Um, and uh, uh, among the most uh, uh, vocal were uh, Jamaicans and Trinidadians. Broader context for uh, the United States, of course, was the uh, Civil Rights Movement, um, the war in Vietnam, uh, and the emerging uh, black power movement. Okay, uh, Ottawa then became increasingly concerned that events in the United States and elsewhere uh, could lead to unrest and disruption in Canada. And they had some reason um, to uh, hold that belief. 1968, uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia activists extended invitations to uh, Black Panther Party members from the United States to visit um, and organized a human rights conference on the subject of, quote, the black man in Nova Scotia. Long considered one of the most quiescent of, of the communities, the Haligonians forced the local government to address issues of prejudice, poverty, and entitlement. One of the persons that they invited to come to Nova Scotia was the Trinidad-born U.S. activist Stokely Carmichael, an honorary member of the Black Panther Party, uh, but uh, better known at the time um, as the chair from 1966 to 1967 of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, the uh, grassroots civil rights organization uh, that pioneered uh, popular education and voter rights in the U.S. South. Uh, the visitors drew comparisons between Halifax and such U.S. cities as Boston, 
in Oakland, California, uh, where the uh, Panthers had branches. They stressed the common problems of minorities in all of these areas. Uh, some Panther members, uh, including Bobby Seal, stayed on in Canada in late November to attend the Hemispheric Conference to end the war in Vietnam. So uh, there, were, there were many uh, forces pushing aside uh, you know, purely nationalist uh, 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 commitments and uh, uh, branching out. Some 1,500 representatives of various groups and governments were present at this hemispheric conference, including officials from North Vietnam, Cuba, and Chile, countries that were viewed with some hostility by the United States and Canada. Events such as this one were not the only articulations of black assertiveness in Canada. Students and community activists organized a series of conferences at McGill University in the 1960s that focused on Caribbean identity and economic development. Uh, the planners included uh, Robert A. Hill, later known for his work in editing and publishing the Marcus Garvey and UNIA papers, author George Lamming, keynoted the first of these conferences and uh, C.L.R. James, the historian slash revolutionist slash theorist, uh, keynoted the Senate. In 1968, the Congress of Black Writers convened in Montreal where attendees linked black power to struggles in Canada and to the desire of youth to connect intellectual work with activism. The Congress had four themes. One, the origins and consequences of the black-white confrontation. Two, the germs of modern black awareness. Three, retrospectives. And four, thoughts for the future. Speakers included James, the Guyanese historian Walter Rodney, and US civil rights leader James Foreman. Participants were called an atmosphere of almost evangelical fervor and a focus on black liberation as an international movement. Montreal centered on black power as an ideology with cultural and political potential to alter the moral map of Africa uh, and the diaspora and to provide a new set of self-assertions for all. There were, of course, more than one formulation of black power. I think the one that we, we look back on this era, the one that uh, perhaps uh, comes uh, you know, most frequently to mind, uh, is a, a, a sort of a, a left-wing populism that we associate with, uh, uh, as one historian put it, the shikis of democracy. <laughs> uh, but there were uh, other ways in which people interpreted this. Right? And, and one was a fairly conservative, uh, based on some of the things that had been uh, written uh, by both uh, the American uh, early, uh, late 19th century uh, uh, leader, Booker T. Washington, um, and Marcus Garvey himself, right? uh, in which they stressed the need to develop economically sustained, racially separatist communities. Um, President Richard Nixon, of all people, uh, latched on to this. Um, his view is that uh, economic development in the black community in the United States uh, should follow a black capitalist path. Okay? Um, the idea was that people who had a stake in the system were not going to loot or burn down buildings. So uh, uh, black capitalism uh, was promoted by some people as the way that black power should operate. Okay? It was a conservative-oriented uh, uh, view of what the uh, uh, expression could mean. Right? Nixon went further than rhetoric because in 1969, he created the Federal Office of Minority Business Enterprise, right? um, in which instead of uh, 
uh, providing a redistribution of resources to the poor, as uh, Lyndon Johnson had been interested in, President Lyndon Johnson, Nixon's approach was, well, let's help a black business class develop. So when we think about black power during this period, uh, we also need to bear in mind that uh, uh, it was variously interpreted. It was variously interpreted, but very often interpreted as a threat. North of the US border, black power drew the interest of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP. The agency made lists of students perceived as radicals. Sir George Williams University in Montreal was considered a special hotspot. Reports of the creation of a local Black Panther chapter evoke concerns about the direct connection with the United States that the officials wish to discourage. This development affirmed ongoing ties between the intelligence services in Canada and the United States. Cooperation now involved exchanging information about dissonance. When in November 1969, Chicago-based Black Panther Fred Hampton and others gave talks at the universities of Alberta and Saskatchewan, RCMP agents recorded their speeches, traced their phone calls, and followed them. Now, while the United States is commonly seen as the great juggernaut of the West during the period, Canada earned a hegemonic status of its own. The initiatives of activists moving across the Canadian-US border erased some of the distance between neighbors that shared similar proclivities of not identical political culture. African-American experience went shape to how various groups framed their respective struggles, but US citizens did not dominate these events. Independent histories of revolt in specific locales paralleled and intersected aspects of North American history with their own dynamics. US historians have focused on the wave of independence in African countries in the 1960s, but have been less connected to the surge of Caribbean independence occurring at the same time. The international black power movement coincided with the growing realization that sovereignty had not produced equal opportunity for the masses of black people in the Americas. Like their counterparts on the African continent, North American critics of the new nations harbored suspicions of their bourgeoisies, identified neocolonialism in the structural inequality of their respective political economies, and honored indigenous cultural forms and, and practices long disdained as uncouth and unworthy. Many conventionally trained intellectuals prepared to recast their roles in the service of a newly projected emancipatory culture. And I'm wondering if I'm missing a slide here. Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. The disaffection of critics stung some Caribbean governments whose initial instinct was to couple repression with efforts to co-opt insurgent energies. They argued that black power was redundant in countries that already boasted black rulers and black majorities. Some removed obvious neocolonial symbols. Endorsing black power provided a way for Guyanese Prime Minister Forbes Burnham, with US help, to neutralize the comeback efforts of Marxist politician Chetty Jagan and stave off, at least for a while, Indo Guyanese political aspiration. Trinidad allowed the widely proscribed Stokely Carmichael to visit his birthplace. Co optation facilitated the reclamation of previously disdained traditions some of these subjugated knowledges that Foucault talked about. Carnival, Rastafarianism, 
Creole languages and dialects. Concessions, however, were not the only weapon in official arsenals. Barbados endorsed black power, but barred foreign radicals from entering the country. Jamaican authorities banned black power literature from the United States and blocked historian Walter Rodney from resuming his post at the University of the West Indies because of his populism and activism. University students there squared off against the police in the ensuing protests, resulting in three deaths and hundreds of thousands of dollars in property damage. Trinidad, facing large-scale unemployment and trade imbalances, sought to quell labor unrest. It seemed to many Trinidadians, both black and Asian, that colonial politics had continued under a black regime. In addition to an attachment to the status quo, some governments in the hemisphere felt compelled for both foreign and domestic reasons to mute any association with Cuba to avoid upsetting the Cold War apple cart. North American disaffection was drawn together through an incident that occurred in Canada. The arrest in 1968 of a group of Caribbean exchange students who were accused of destroying a million dollar computer at Sir George Williams University in Montreal. Okay, this slide requires a little bit of explanation for anybody under the age of 50. <laughs> um, uh, during, during this particular uh, uh, era, this was you know, before the rise of the PC, uh, computers, university computers are big mainframes. Right? Um, and you, uh, the, the interface was not a screen, uh, it was paper. Uh, you punched data into cards. Um, and it was, that was actually a job, it was called key punch operator, right? Uh, you punch data into cards, and the uh, computers uh, spit out the results on the paper. And uh, very often, if you made a typing mistake, the job would, you know, wouldn't run, and you just have all this paper lying around, right? So these students were accused of, 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 of wrecking of the computer, and uh, you can see they also would throw, had thrown uh, papers around uh, you know, that uh, dot matrix paper around on the, uh, on the ground. The arrest of the students, including some Trinidadians, was viewed as unjustified by those protesting in Trinidad against the Eric Williams administration. Oil and sugar workers, students, and the unemployed created an oppositional umbrella group, the National Joint Action Committee, NJAC, um, uh, for which carnival became an outlet for protest, as revelers took to the streets carrying posters depicting forbidden figures such as Mao Zedong and Malcolm X. Prime Minister Williams, a historian and author of the classic uh, Capitalism and Slavery, had brilliantly analyzed imperialism in the late 1940s. Years later, however, accused of neo-colonial authoritarianism, he made militant moves by levying a surtax on corporations and by nationalizing the Bank of London and the Bank of Montreal. So these gestures, however, did not satisfy his critics. Now what, what I'd like to do now is to run down uh, uh, some events that occur in 1970 in, um, in uh, Trinidad um, and uh, talk about the significance. In February 1970, police in downtown Port of Spain attacked an NJAC demonstration that marked the occasion of the Sir George Williams students' trial. Local students then occupied the Roman Catholic Cathedral and the Royal Bank of Canada. Following the arrest of the group's leaders, some eight to 10,000 persons assembled in protest. Another mass meeting of 10,000 ensued on March 4th, when bombing and arson followed police assaults. Seeking to divide and conquer, the authorities painted the protesters as uh, the protests as black racialist attacks on uh, East 
Indians. To refute this, Injac plantation workers organized trips to the countryside where urban dwellers were to assist East Indian sugar workers. The Ministry of Industry denounced this move as a Cuban plot. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> Cuba was known for its attempts to uh, reduce uh, regional and class uh, uh, differences uh, by bringing people to the countryside to harvest the sugar crop, right? So uh, this was seen as you know, uh, uh, imitating that model. Violence spiked again in April following the police shooting of a black youth. Some 35,000 persons attended his funeral, which was followed by a wave of strikes, including those of the sugar workers and the powerful oil fields workers union. Williams declared a state of emergency on April 21st and arrested black power activists and trade unionists. Right here you see uh, police removing um, uh, uh, political material uh, that had been posted on walls and gates. Newspapers were subject to censorship and radical literature banned. The day of the march, units of the Trinidadian Army refused to obey a mobilization order and seized an ammunition and stuff. The government was on the brink of collapse. Acting swiftly, Williams ordered the Trinidadian Coast Guard to fire on the mutineers and retake the arm, <coughs> excuse me, retake the arms cache with weapons from Venezuela and the United States, whose navies were standing by. In May, sectors of the army mutinied again, mutinied again with the aim of joining guerrillas already operating in the capital. While Williams succeeded ultimately in regaining control, the depth of popular anger was unmistakable. Okay, so what, what's the significance of all of this? And why, uh, you know, why relate it? <clears throat> the Trinidad situation marked an extreme, but points to a general crisis in North America and the salience of geography in an era not yet reliant on the internet. What happened in Canada was enraging people in the Caribbean. Events in the United States were concerning to people in Canada. Given the failures of the West and its allies to address historic grievances originating in the colonial past and being perpetuated in the present, conventional statism was again questioned, as it had been during the days of the Moyne Commission during the Great Depression of the 1930s. In this spirit, international planning began in 1973 for a sixth Pan-African Congress to be held the following year. Unlike earlier Pan-African Congresses, which uh, uh, convened in metropolitan capitals, this one would take place in independent Africa, whereas the uh, last uh, Pan-African Congress, the, the fifth one, uh, was convened in Manchester, UK in 1945. Uh, that one had uh, been organized chiefly by uh, politicized labor parties uh, and was concerned primarily with decolonization. Uh, this sixth Congress uh, was driven by social movements and by new black governments. Uh, and it did not focus fully on labor issues or relations with great powers. Now, of course, everybody agreed that uh, Portuguese colonialism and apartheid in South Africa had to end. But beyond that, commitments were vague. Interested governments were keen to follow the progress of Congress planning. Canadian intelligence furnished the only spy in attendance at the July 21st, 1973 steering committee meeting in Washington, D.C. So you can see the radicals were not the only ones crossing borders. In a report on dissident activities in Ottawa, intelligence analysts 
described an international protest movement that has long seen the third world as the next step in the battle against racism and imperialism. With the Vietnam War winding down, they argued, the movement now concentrated on transnational capitalism. Officials anticipated continuing and escalating pressure from dissidents as energy shortages, fiscal uncertainty, popular unrest, drought, and hunger burdened emerging nations. In this climate, many disillusioned diaspora nationalists had sought African countries that appeared committed to progressive change. In the 1960s, this meant Ghana, until the overthrow of the Nkrumah government in 1966. And later, uh, Tanzania inherited that mantle. Each of those meccas embodied a moral geography of pan-Africanist aspiration, a frontier where a homecoming diaspora might pitch its tents. Yet discomfiture with black power among newly independent African states sharpened Radical's critique that the new nation's leaders were less interested in liberation than in control. Sovereignty had not brought relief from the stagnant economies of the colonial period. Black bases in high places did not necessarily mean black power. Freedom and justice were called into question when the African and Caribbean states themselves sought to police the Congress, censor debate, and curtailed dissidents. The Pan-African Congress was a global initiative that encountered resistance from officials committed to solidifying rather than eliding national borders. Black extremists had a hand in the Congress, FBI acting director William Ripplehouse wrote. He saw the goal of international revolutionary Pan-Africanism and the unity of all people of African descent as a threat to the United States. Law enforcement agencies from throughout the world, the FBI warned, were interested in various aspects of that event. The Bureau notified all of its field offices and instructed them to arrange surveillance of any planning activities being held in their areas. It placed a source at a planning meeting in Guyana with instructions to discover any Cuban involvement uh, in it or funding of the Congress. They found no evidence, however, that Pan-Africanists received money from Cuba or any Warsaw Pact country, or that they'd ever asked for any. In Canada, the Royal uh, Canadian Mounted Police began providing intelligence uh, on Pan-African activities not only to Washington but now to other Commonwealth capitals as well. The Sixth Pan-African Congress opened on June 19, 1974, on the University College of Dar es Salaam campus. The character of the delegations is telling. 24 African countries and five Caribbean nations sent official representatives. Seven national liberation organizations uh, that uh, were uh, represented or, or that were um, uh, uh, recognized by the Organization of African Unity participated. Delegations that did not represent states or approved liberation movements um, arrived from various countries. The largest group of non-governmental actors, some 200 strong, arriving from the United States. Now, uh, this really uh, sort of opens up uh, one of the fissures in the Congress. Right? Uh, it raises the question of, uh, was, was the Pan-African uh, Congress be a council of states? Um, if not, what is, would be the status of uh, non-governmental uh, actors? And what would their role be in terms of uh, resource and power sharing? Uh, regional coordinators uh, had tried to restrict the numbers of uh, non-governmental uh, actors, uh, particularly in the, in the United States, 
By choosing a few uh, they deemed official and allowing other people to attend the conference uh, as observers. Once in Dar es Salaam, uh, the Tanzanian hosts whittled down the African Americans down to about 10 official representatives. <laughs> On stage at the Congress, multiple contestants, states, proto-states, and dissidents, strove to impose their particular visions, nationalist and post-nationalist, on the future African world. The structural difference between national minorities uh, and sovereign majorities was revealed in Dar es Salaam as an important problem. States can oppose, accede to, or absorb challenges to the prevailing system of sovereignties posed by social movements and minority populations. Thus, the seizure of the Congress by governments that barred Caribbean dissidents and simultaneously limit, limited the participation of an already fractured black American delegation um, raised some interesting uh, issues. Statism rendered minorities and private citizens marginal to the aim of Pan-African progress, leaving unaddressed and unresolved, leaving unaddressed, unresolved inequalities. The black power concept already impeded by the variety of its possible meanings, could leave these outsiders functioning as lobbyists for black governments, but unable to help themselves. Clearly, no one center, neither Canada, the US, nor the independent states of the Caribbean, was a prime mover in the black power movement that proliferated internationally during the Europe. Consequently, we must wonder about the extent to which any state historically composed of disparate and sometimes warring elements authentically represents a coherent population. With the developing countries clinging to flag nationalism, globalization in the form of deregulation and privatization began eroding the discourses that marked the original path to independence. Nationalism had compelled an understanding of Africa that would prevail over the colonial era's stereotypes. But what happens after sovereignty? How appalling that today, decades of civil war, stalled economies, and natural disasters seem to have so effectively demolished so much painstaking progress. In an ironic twist of moral geography, Catastrophes challenge the notion of diaspora as communities located outside Africa. Inside Africa, millions of displaced persons trudged across the map from one dystopia to another as non-citizens, exiles, and refugees. We find on the planet today a retreat from imaginaries across national lines even in the visceral presence of immigrants and communities, whether voluntary or coerced, excluded or tolerated, and the paradoxical omnipresence of a capitalist order that ignores borders with impunity in pursuit of its goals. Foucault, in Discipline and Punish, saw the surveillance technology of the prison panopticon as the premier example of governmentality. In today's world, it is Google and Facebook that perform those functions much more thoroughly. It is also Google that has usurped the cartographic powers previously assumed and monopolized by the state. At this point, we might consider if it's possible to reaffirm a moral geography of liberty as a strategic tool to counter the ultranationalism and bigotry evidenced in today's world. This will mean thinking beyond the Mercator projection, beyond the fictional boundaries of nations and state ideologies, and embracing a holistic view of human freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Pam. Another round of applause. That was
Professor Plummer has agreed to take uh, questions. So I know we have a roving mic. So if you indicate uh, your wish to ask a question, uh, we will find you. My name is Rupert Lewis. Thank you very much for your presentation. Just two points. One is the, the way you put the African Indian issue in the 19th century Trinidad as a Cuban kind of uh, people going out to the community, into the rural community. I think there's a what deeper issue there. Uh, the deeper issue is that it's the reframing of black power in Trinidad as against totally Carmichael's insistence that the Indian should do something for themselves and the African should do something for themselves. So there was a big effort of the 1970s Trinidadian black activists to develop Afro-Indian solidarity. Mm -hmm. That was a central part of their, uh, their efforts. And the campus, the Indian group on campus, was very active within that march to the south. Um, that's just a minor kind of point. But the other point which uh, I'm concerned about, I find your conclusion uh, a little abrupt. Abrupt in the sense of you move towards a kind of humanism towards the end. But I'm not seeing the connections with the black movements. There's probably a lot of history that needs to be pulled out in terms of where you are uh, crit critiquing the, quite correctly, Google, Facebook, that world that we are in now, which transcends borders and the traps that we find ourselves in, in terms of nation state sovereignty that don't work. So it's that connection. Uh, yeah, I, I did say that uh, the uh, inject people were accused yeah. of, of following the Cuban model. And I you think you, you're absolutely correct uh, that you know, they weren't uh, you know, uh, about to put themselves in that position of uh, you know, allowing the authorities to divide and conquer. Um, on on the, the conclusion, I think what, what I'm trying to say here is that um, there have been failures of the nation state. Um, and that uh, you know, uh, what we saw in, you know, in the late 60s and the, in, in the 70s was uh, basically eruptions caused by the uh, inability of the state states to uh, make good on their promises. Right? Not only the emerging countries, but the established ones as well. Right? You know, clearly, you know, you probably uh, you know, realize uh, that you know, the failure of uh, you know, the United States to deal with racism right? uh, was the engine of you know, a lot of the you know, violent reactions that occurred in, you know, in the United States. Uh, during that time. I think if, if we look at the present day world, um, I think once again we see the failures of, of states uh, to protect citizens, um, to uh, you know, create rational uh, uh, economies, to fairly distribute resources. Right? So you know, every few months there's you know, some, you know, some major, uh, you know, government is experiencing uh, hacking, right? Um, you know, what does it mean if the government cannot protect its own information, right? Much less yours. <laughs> uh, so uh, again, I think, uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, among the engines driving these extremist movements, you know, uh, the Islamic State and uh, uh, neo-Nazism and all of this, uh, has to do with you know, perceived failures of, of, of you know, conventional government. No, that's, that's how I address that. Jerry. 
see anybody, so I'm. Uh... <laughs> All right. Hello, my name is Jerry. As a Rastafari, I want to um, tell you that um, the speech that Bob that um, Haile Selassie made, <coughs> that Bob Marley amplified. Haile Selassie shared what life taught him. And he said, until the philosophy that would want to reappear and then appear, the script that abandoned the old war. Also, <coughs> Until there is no longer the first and second class citizenship of any nation, there will be one. And if um, monarchy is not first class citizenship, I don't know what is. And if, if poor people are common up, it's not second class citizenship. Mm -hmm. I don't know what is. So I listen as himself, no, that monarchy is a temporary arrangement in the affairs of human. But it's a very difficult thing. I'm true that I'm so popular amongst Rastafari. I am Rastafari. Mm -hmm. But I'm not too popular amongst Rastafari because I'm a Roman person, otherwise. Mm -hmm. I listen as a new. Mm -hmm. That monarchy is a temporary arrangement in the affairs of men. Mm -hmm. And the monarchy that him um, spring from, it derives its um, authenticity from the house of Israel. When well, they come out of Africa after 400 years in Africa mm -hmm. and were setting up themselves as a nation state, mm -hmm. them they just have a laws and a panel of judges. But the Israelites like all the Philistines and the people around them have king. All of them have nationality and father of mm -hmm. nation. Mm -hmm. And them tell the, the, the judges them say, we want a king, and the judges tell them say no. You know, if you have no king, you know, it's a brotherhood and sisterhood. And they say, no, we want king, how we like see the national holiday and the national parade with the people around us. And the, the panel of judges tell them, say, God say, I know, I know we the panel are insulting, him, God, 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 and king. So tell them, say, the king, then, when you set up a king, I'm going to take your man, I'm going to take your son, the man making an army, and work them all and kill them off. I'm going to take your daughter, the man fornicate them. And I'm going to take real land them and all them things. That's how King be. Right. And then say, we want King. And then and put him give them first King Saul. And then give them to David and Christ. Right. But I was laughing. No, say that is not a forever thing. But it's the mm -hmm. hardest thing. But little by little, no first of our brethren and sister, no, say. Until there is no longer first and second class citizenship, mm -hmm. there will be war. Yeah. Just come and find that. Yeah. Yeah. Can you comment on that too, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's certainly a, a, a different interpretation than the one that I had you know, uh, studied and, and learned. Well, it's certainly the case that that uh, you know uh, the British could make use of Haile Selassie. They could make use of it in 1936 or 41. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they could. They could. Sorry, and, they tried, and they tried to take over Ethiopia too. Jerry, mm -hmm. and, in, and Barclays Bank did over Ethiopia. Um, mm -hmm. Keep now while you do over Ethiopia money. Mm -hmm. I'm here to Mussolini and say, so that's you know, King. But things change. And uh, what, do, what does it mean that until there is no longer first and second class? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Uh, well, <laughs> that means, you know, a perfect democracy. Yes, I was going to know that that's my last word. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. But our Rastafari version, it takes time for them now. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Enrique Okenve. Um, I, I just like you to elaborate a little bit more. I had the feeling, I mean, I think the impression I was thinking throughout your presentation that you're talking about this sort of like a black power in a way, like like a, a, a section of black nationalism mm -hmm. and, 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 and and so on. And these are transnational ideas, right? Um, and I think, um, I think perhaps, I don't know if you can say a bit more because what, what is happening in the 1960s is that independence movement. And I don't know if like, the, the sort of like, uh, issue that you are pointing out is that how maybe in a way um, the emergence of these uh, independent uh, nations, in, whether it is in the Caribbean or in, in Africa in a way sort of like a, undermine, undermine these, um, this kind of like, uh, black nationalist ideas and, 
and, and, and so on. And, and I think I'm, I'm also thinking in, in terms of like developments uh, leading to, to today in which like uh, we see some level of reemergence of some of these ideas. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if uh, perhaps uh, uh, this is what you're suggesting that in a way that the sort of like nation state at the time that is it's uh, experiencing some sort of crisis also can uh, facilitate perhaps the reemergence of, of these ideas that uh, no matter how influential and powerful they were, mm -hmm. it seems that they stumbled up upon the, the, the nation state as, mm -hmm. the, as the, the obstacle that they could not um, overcome. So, so yeah, to speak. yeah. Um, uh, black power and the nation state uh, uh, both had the capacity to undermine each other in a sense that um, Remember that the African and Caribbean independence was <clears throat> meant to be um, not only a break from foreign rule, it was also meant to be uh, the release of creative energies. It was meant to be uh, uh, resources that you know, people had developed, uh, uh, the, the people who developed them being allowed to, you know, to command them and make use of them. Um, it meant um, uh, uh, the increased democratic participation. Right? Those those were the aspirations, yeah. and so uh, uh, nations then would be judged on how well they uh, uh, satisfied those aspirations. Yeah. And the the, the uh, black power then, in some of its manifestations, manifestations, uh, was a critique of the shortcomings of these governments. Right? Now, the, the other side of the coin um, is that uh, uh, governments uh, could uh, look at what they saw as uh, you know, some of the, the, the flimsiness of, of black power ideology. Uh, they could, you know, again, one of the common arguments was, uh, why talk about black power in a black country? Uh, when uh, you know, the, the rulers are, are, are black, the, 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 the voters are black, what's the problem? Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem, again, was the, a problem of you know, how is the state uh, functioning? Right? Um, uh, is it uh, meeting the expectations that had been, um, uh, you know, that emerged during the uh, colonial period? Uh, so, um, uh, you know, in terms of the, you know, the, the, the emergence in today's world of transnational ideologies, you know, they're not all, I think, created equal. Right? Um, there's, one thing, there's one thing to talk about uh, Pan-African internationalism. Right? That certainly can't be equated with neo-Nazism. Uh, but uh, what we are seeing in uh, these sort of uh, you know, extra nationalists or post nationalists, whatever you want to say, these sort of international movements um, is that uh, you know, people are uh, experiencing the uh, inability of states to perform the functions that um, they have conventionally uh, been designed to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to do. I can't see, so I can't call you. Can you just stand and see you? Okay, understand. Yes, this is Brian. Um, I, 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 what I wanted you to say a bit more about was what you felt was what was uh, pushing forward these things. You talked about different movements and different. Um, or, not organizations, mm -hmm. certainly different movements in different parts of the world, different geography, use that term in like moral geography. I wanted, and I think there are people here who might not know what those, or, what those movements are actually about. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it would help if you could say a bit more about what was driving these movements at this particular time. What was it was happening in Canada that brought these um, um, groups forward, what was happening in, in North America and uh, in certain parts of Africa. You said a bit about, certainly about Pan-Africanism, internationalism, but I think 
I think I want to hear more about what was the driving force in that particular period and in these um, different places. Great question, and I, I, I think I, to answer it as fully as I would like, we will be here for another two or three hours. But uh, in a nutshell, uh, uh, we really had sort of a perfect storm of, of certain things coming together. Uh, one, of course, uh, as uh, suggested, was the impact of uh, independence. Um, another was uh, the war in Vietnam, which concerned not only the United States, but had global implications for uh, people mounting criticisms of the behavior of the United States and, and other superpowers. Um, uh, we had a civil rights movement in the United States. Uh, we had uh, uh, other minority populations in North America um, uh, looking at their own civil rights uh, uh, situation. Uh, and again, I mentioned uh, you know, the uh, indigenous, indigenous people in, the United States, in uh, Canada and the United States, uh, as well as uh, the uh, Quebec, the French Canadian uh, uh, movement for uh, uh, separatism. Um, part of you know, what was fueling uh, all of this uh, was uh, a, a period of uh, relative global prosperity. Um, and a, an international cohort of youth okay, um, who, after World War II, um, were increasingly exposed to higher education. And this, this was just not in the United States, it was you know, other places as well. So, so one of the things that we see in terms of uh, you know, uh, the, uh, who's participating in these movements, a lot of them are uh, our youth, our young people. Um, uh, I think we also uh, see a situation in which, uh, after World War II, certain idealistic principles uh, became um, at least ostensibly uh, modeled for global uh, consumption. Yeah self-determination, uh, the human rights, um, uh, the, uh, the ability of people to, uh, to vote and participate in the political life of their country, so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, the enunciation of all of this was fine, but where the problem came was in the gap between um, the rhetoric and the reality. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, these rebellions and movements uh, uh, during this period were highly aspirational. Right? They were about attempting to close that gap right? in various ways. Thank you so much again, um, Professor Plummer, for that, for that stimulating lecture and for everyone who offered um, questions and comments. There will be more opportunities uh, to speak with Professor Pama and to talk with her, not just at the reception which immediately follows this, this lecture, but also on Thursday afternoon, we are organizing in conjunction with our partner uh, at the UE Museum, uh, Dr. Suzanne Francis Brown, an event called UE in the 1960s uh, Teaching. Uh, since 2015, we've been uh, having these, uh, these occasional uh, events, uh, the Department of History and Archaeology and UWI Museum around the theme really in the 1960s. So the next one will be this week and uh, Professor Plummer has uh, graciously agreed to be on hand uh, to participate in that. What we will be doing at that session will be having graduates of the University of West Indies in the 1960s, people who have been here, who were here and graduated during the span of the decade of the 1960s discussing uh, what student life was like, what their activism was like, what their motivations were, and also their own impressions then of larger movements and causes beyond uh, the island and the region. Uh, and of course, Professor Plummer will be there and can um, help us do as she did very, very well and expertly here this evening, connect all of these various threads uh, of the narratives. Uh, so that's, I, I didn't mention the time, that's 5.30, uh, sorry, 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 
in uh, room 03, a very famous room on campus um, back in the 1960s, uh, where, we will, where we will meet um, there in fact of humanities and education, room uh, 03 at 3 o'clock uh, p.m. I would like now to um, offer on behalf of the department our formal thanks to Professor Plummer for, uh, for being here with us and for delivering this lecture. So, Professor Plum, if you wouldn't mind joining me on stage again, we have a, a little gift that we'd like to, um, to give to you. Medium size, without any more. <laughs> Here you go. On behalf of the department, thank you so much for, for sharing. With us. I now uh, invite uh, Mr. Desmond Saunders, a member of the department, a student in the department, and also president of the History and Archaeology Society to bring the vote of thanks. Desmond. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I wish to first offer my personal uh, thanks to Professor Plummer for this extraordinary presentation that you've given to us this evening. The lecture and everything involved with it was only possible due to the support of several persons and entities who on behalf of Professor Smith and the department, I wish to acknowledge. The Office of the Vice Chancellor, Sir Hilary Beckles, and the Office of the Campus Principal Professor Archibald MacDonald were readily supportive of assisting with covering costs for tonight's arrangements. Thanks to them both. The staff in the department worked with typical cheer and grace in making sure all the boxes were checked. They ensured everything was in place for tonight. From the microphone to multiple postings and reminders on Facebook and Twitter, a heartfelt thanks to the dynamic trio of Mrs. Camilla Clark Brown, Mrs. Claudine Walker Robinson, and Mrs. Rodian Dennis Copeland. Our student volunteers from the History and Archaeology Society deserve a special thanks for their assistance. Thanks also to faculty member, especially faculty members rather, especially Dr. Renee Nelson for her help. Respect is due to Mr. Adani Buckley, another student in the department, for technical assistance. A special thanks to history and archaeology major, Ms. Nonika Williams, for decking us out in these very attractive sashes, bow ties, and pocket <laughs> squares. We are assured that tonight's lecture will be around for generations to come. Thanks to the following persons. Mr. Sean McKeeng of the UE Archives Media Lab, who did the audio recording, the crew from MIX who have recorded the video of the event, and our photographer, Mr. Kwame Miller. Thanks to the Philip Sherlock Center for this venue. It is good to be here on your 50th anniversary. For the equipment and services, thanks to UWI Maintenance Department. And for the food which we will very soon enjoy, thanks to our cafe, Natural Touch Cafe, or caterers there. Finally, and by no means least, a very special thanks to you, ladies and gentlemen, students, colleagues, friends, for being with us tonight. Your presence is always the most important aspect of, of these events. It ensures that the stories of our past that we cherish so dearly find respective ears and minds. Thank you so much, and do enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay. Okay.